Government is always ready to consider applications for support to invest in the meat processing sector, including abattoirs. Thank you. That ends general questions. We now move to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Kezia Dugdale. To ask the First Minister what engagement she has planned for the rest of the day. First Minister. Engagement is to take forward the Government's programme for Scotland. Kezia Dugdale. Thank you, President Officer. On Tuesday, something very unusual happened in this Parliament. The SNP lost a vote. Every year, over 20,000 children in Scotland have to deal with a parent going to prison. We don't know exactly how many because we don't bother to count them. Mary Fee, supported by Bernardo's, the NSPCC and Families Outside, amended the Criminal Justice Bill to put that right. Those charities know that if we can find those children, we can support them and we can help them achieve their potential, not any predetermined destiny. That amendment passed at committee stage against the will of the First Minister's MSPs. Of course, she can use the full force of her majority to remove that amendment, that progress, at stage three. So can I ask her, will she respect the committee and promise not to do that? First Minister. Um, I can certainly assure Parliament that we will give full consideration to the amendment that was passed and we will consider uh, whether or not uh, that amendment best meets our objectives to help the children of those sent to prison. I, I hope Kezia Dugdale would recognise the sincerity and the determination of the government. Uh, firstly, to make sure that we're not sending people to prison who do not need to be in prison. I hope she will recognise uh, the change of direction uh, instituted by Michael Matheson around uh, the plans for a women's prison, because we recognise that having women in prison in particular affects children. And all of us want to make sure that we are identifying and ensuring support for children of mothers or fathers uh, who have to serve prison sentences. So we will give full consideration, as the Parliament, I hope, uh, would expect us to do, uh, to that amendment and to other amendments that have been discussed in the course of the Criminal Justice Bill. Thank you. The First Minister and I both talk a lot about closing the attainment gap. These children, affected by parental imprisonment, are about as much on the wrong side of that gap as you possibly can be. They are three times more likely than average to have severe mental health problems. And without help and support, the statistics tell us that over 50% of them will end up in jail themselves. Her Children's Minister, Aileen Campbell, knows what a difference this would make. She proposed these amendments herself from the backbenches in the last Parliament. I may be wrong, but I don't think the plight of these children has ever been raised at First Minister's questions before. So on that basis, I'm going to give the First Minister another chance to do the right thing. Will she instruct her MSPs to support Mary Fee's amendment to the Criminal Justice Bill? First Minister. No, 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 I, order. I'm going to continue to do what I think is the right thing to do. And the right thing to do, having had a vote uh, this week in Parliament, two days ago, on a particular amendment, is for the government to reflect on its own position in light of that vote. Now, the government would not be doing the right thing if we didn't seriously reflect on that position in light of the vote in committee. But we also have to reflect, and um, I'm, I'm going to paraphrase here rather than directly quote because I don't have it in front of me, but this was one of the issues that Ailish Angelini uh, looked at when she did uh, the considerable and respected work in this area uh, and uh, I think came to the conclusion that the social work assessment process that was already in place was right and was adequate. And it's on that basis that the government has taken the position it's taken. But a committee has reached a different position. So in the normal course of things, before we get to the next stage of the passage of this legislation, we will consider our position. And either we will come to Parliament and accept the amendment that has been passed at stage two, or we will come to Parliament and we will give uh, careful reasons why we consider that it would not be the right thing for that amendment to stand. That's the responsible and rational way for any government to proceed in the wake of such a vote. And I'm very happy to discuss it with Kezia Dugdale and with any other member of the Parliament who's interested in this, so that collectively we can come to the right decision as a Parliament and how we best support children and young people uh, whose parents serve prison sentences. That is, presiding officer, the right way to go about it. 
President Officer, it's very clear that the right thing to do would be to support these amendments. The First Minister got uh, an answer there from our Justice Secretary about social work assessments. Let me tell her about social work assessments. There's no mandatory requirement to fill them in. And in fact, over the last year, the number of those assessment forms being filled in has fallen. And the reality of the situation is those assessments are about the parents, not about the kids. Yeah. This is about giving those kids a chance. So if the First Minister won't do anything for children affected by parent in prison... Order! Can I ask her about the lives of children blighted by homelessness? We debated the housing crisis yesterday, but homelessness is the extreme end of that, and the children of homeless families the most vulnerable. So can the First Minister tell the Chamber how many children in Scotland are sleeping in temporary accommodation, and whether that is going up or down? First Minister. This government, uh, I think supported from people across the Parliament, has done a great deal to tackle temporary uh, accommodation for those who are homeless. Uh, we are also on track to meet our target in terms of building uh, new order. homes in order that we can continue to provide the homes that those uh, either who are homeless uh, or people who require different or bigger uh, accommodation need. I mean, it was Ian Gray uh, sitting next to Kezia Dugdale uh, who once said that Labour passed world-leading uh, housing legislation but just didn't bother to do anything about building the houses to support that world-leading legislation. Uh, this government... This government is making sure that we have the right legislation in place, but also that we're making the right investment to build the houses that are needed to support that legislation, and that's what we'll continue to do. Now, on the uh, matter of children uh, whose parents serve prison sentences, because this is a very important issue, and I'm very happy to seek to build consensus, but Kezia Dugdale said to me it was absolutely clear what was the right thing to do. Well, I'm not sure I am yet in a position to say with clarity what the right thing to do on this is, because we have work that's been done that the government has based its position on. A parliamentary committee has taken a different position, and it is incumbent on me as First Minister, it is incumbent on the Justice Secretary to consider all of that carefully before we come to a conclusion, because it is so important that we give the right support to children in these circumstances. So I will continue to give uh, this matter the attention it deserves, and we will continue to treat this matter as seriously uh, as we should do. And I give a commitment to Kezia Dugdale and people across the chamber that we will consult with them, we are happy to discuss it further with them, and try to proceed in a way that commands support across the parliamentary chamber. Ms Dugdale. President Officer, she's had eight years to know what the right thing to do for these children is. And I asked her very specifically about children in temporary accommodation, so let me give her the answer. The answer is 4,555 children live in temporary accommodation without a home of their own. That's up by 402 children in the last year alone. After eight years in government, the First Minister is presiding over a rise in the number of children sleeping in temporary housing. She is resisting helping children affected by a parent in prison. Yep. And we haven't even started on Order. the 16,000 children, the 16,000 rejections for child mental health services. These children are waiting for us to help them. We cannot wait any longer to act. If she's serious about closing the gap, really serious, surely the First Minister will commit today to producing an action plan for Scotland's most vulnerable children. First Minister. Oh, everything. Everything that my government does uh, will be intended to help the most vulnerable in our society and particularly the most vulnerable children. And actually, this is something that we should seek to agree on, not to divide on. Let me just run through, okay. let me just run through some of the, the issues that Kezia Dugdale had raised. Uh, we're investing heavily in child and adolescent mental health services. We're seeing an increase in the number of staff uh, working in child and adolescent uh, mental health services in order that we can target waiting times that have been too long and reduce those waiting times uh, to the target time. In fact, uh, I specifically mentioned uh, CAMS, Child and Adolescent Mental Health Services, in my programme for government statement just last week. Uh, on homelessness, this government is making sure that we have the right legislative framework in place, but also that we have the right investment 
investment in place uh, to tackle and to reduce and to eliminate homelessness. But, you know, Kezia Dugdale cannot surely stand here in this chamber today and deny the impact of welfare Absolutely. cuts on things like Absolutely. homelessness and poverty Absolutely. in our country. And this time last year, of course... Oh, Kezia duh. This time last year, of course, Kezia Dugdale uh, was arguing vigorously and strongly for the Tories to remain in charge of welfare issues. And that is why... That is why her credibility on this issue might be a little bit stretched. For our part... Order. For our part, Presiding Officer, we're spending £104 million this year to mitigate the impact of welfare reform. To add that to what we're doing on legislation, on investment in housing, that £104 million will help to mitigate the impact of welfare reform. I think it would be better if Kezia Dugdale uh, got behind us in some of these actions uh, and actually stopped arguing for the Tories to remain in charge of these things and equip this Parliament to do it even better. Question two, Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister when she'll next meet the Secretary of State for Scotland. First Minister. I have no plans in the near future. Ruth Davidson. Presiding Officer, we know that qualifications in the so-called STEM subjects of science, technology, engineering and maths at school unlock doors to a huge variety of careers. We also know that far too few young women are taking up those opportunities at school. When I asked the First Minister about this in January, she said, and I'll, I'll quote from the official report, I readily agree that we need to get more girls and women into STEM subjects. I do not take the view that we've done everything that we need to do, but we are doing the hard work. So let's see what hard work they're doing. Can I ask the First Minister what measures she's outlined to address this, perhaps in her programme for government or indeed in her framework for Scottish education? First well, Minister. I think this is an important issue, so let me just run through uh, some of the work we're doing to increase the number uh, of women uh, participating in STEM subjects. Then I'll come on to some of the progress that's been made, both in terms of school qualifications and college and uh, university education. Uh, firstly, we're doing a range of things uh, to encourage uh, more girls at school to take uh, these subjects. Uh, Ruth Davidson will be familiar uh, with, for example, the funding we're giving to Equate uh, Scotland uh, and as well as school uh, efforts that will also uh, be focused at getting more women into modern apprenticeships in STEM subjects. We're also uh, funding work to get more paid uh, placements for female undergraduates into STEM subjects. We are uh, funding Equate uh, Scotland to support recruitment, retention uh, and return of women where they're significantly underrepresented. We're supporting Close the Gap, uh, which is about changing employment practices. Now, in terms of school qualifications, uh, if we look at the most recent figures we've got available, 48% uh, of passes in STEM subjects at SQF levels 3 to 7 were attained uh, by females. That's a slight increase in the previous year, but there's still work to do. If we look at females at college, uh, again, looking at the most recent statistics, we've seen a 20% increase in the number of women doing science and maths, a 32% increase in the number doing engineering. Uh, at university, we've got a 56% increase. These are uh, compared to 2006-07 on engineering and technology. So we are making significant efforts here. We are starting to see some progress, uh, but I think this is an area where there is a considerable amount of work that we still require to do, because I want us to have, not just in the professions where women are underrepresented, but also in the professions where men are underrepresented, I want to see us have much greater gender equality. Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The pathway into science and engineering jobs starts in schools, but there's no mention in the First Minister's plans for the year ahead of doing anything about this. Literally zero mentions. And unsurprisingly, with no plans for improvement at school level, there isn't any improvement at school level. And you'll notice the statistics the First Minister missed out that show that uh, attainment is going in the other direction. New figures show that since the SNP came to power, the share of young women in higher maths is down, the share in computing is down, in physics and technology is as low as it has ever been. 
And if you contrast that with elsewhere, where there are programmes to make a real improvement, the UK Government has invested £10 million in this area, and guess what? Their numbers have gone up. In Scotland, the First Minister talks a good game. You've just heard some very selective figures. But she does nothing physically. And guess what? The numbers have gone down. They've gone down and higher across the board. So we are in a whole new school year since I last asked the First Minister about this. And she agreed then that more needed to be done. So when will she finally back those words and the words today and get on with the action which is so urgently required? First Minister. Well, I've just given Ruth Davidson a range of uh, things that we're doing. Let me add to that. Skills Development Scotland uh, have supported the appointment of two project officers to work specifically with schools uh, to look at best classroom practice in reducing gender imbalance uh, in terms of students progressing to STEM subjects, and they're focusing particularly on physics. Uh, these project officers will provide practical support for primary schools, for secondary school science departments. They're arranging activities for students and implementing whole school approaches to tackling gender stereotypes. Now, Ruth Davidson says I'm quoting selectively. I'm simply quoting uh, the figures based on the most recent figures we have around passes in STEM subjects. Now, I quoted levels three to seven. Uh, let me also look at level seven, which is advanced higher. Um, 44.7% of passes in STEM subjects at level seven uh, attained by females. That's a 2.1 percentage point increase on 2011-12. So I'm not suggesting that there's not much more uh, work we still need to do. But what I will not accept is that this is not a government absolutely determined uh, to do the hard work so that we do have a situation where we don't have the gender underrepresentation in some of these subjects that has been the case for far too long. Neil Findlay. Last week, uh, WRL Gore announced 120 redundancies that are planned in Livingston. Uh, what assurances has the Scottish Government received from Gore about the remaining jobs and what support will be given to those who are to lose their jobs? First Minister. Well, firstly, um, obviously this will be a very concerning time for those employed at Gotex and their families. Uh, the Government is already engaging uh, with the company and, as is always the case in these situations, uh, the pace uh, provisions will be made fully available and uh, the Finance Secretary will continue to keep uh, very closely engaged on this issue. John Finney. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister what assessment will be made of procedures employed in relation to the seizure a non-return of a Sea Shepherd boat from Lairwick Harbour? First Minister. Well, obviously, uh, it would be inappropriate for me to comment in detail on this because it, it is a, a matter under uh, criminal investigation. The, the Crown Office received a letter of uh, request from the Faeries authorities um, and subsequently sought a warrant, uh, which was then executed um, in this matter. Uh, that was on the basis of allegations of criminal activity. But given the circumstances, presiding officer, it would not be appropriate for me to say any more on this issue. Question three, Willie Rennie. To ask the First Minister what issues will be discussed at the next meeting of the Cabinet. First Minister. Uh, matters of importance to the people of Scotland. Willie Rennie. Last week, the Education Secretary defended the Government's return to national school testing by quoting to me the apparent support of the EIS Teaching Union. But two days later, that claimed support evaporated. The EIS said this, it will be almost impossible to put in place safeguards which would, put, which would stop national assessments leading to league table and target setting agendas. As the EIS is now opposed, will she now rethink her plans for national testing? First Minister. Well, we'll continue to work uh, with teachers, with local authorities, with parents in order that we are taking the action that will allow us to raise attainment and to close the attainment gap. The Education Secretary met with the EIS uh, yesterday. We continue to work constructively uh, with them. Uh, let me repeat what I said last week in my programme for government statement. I think there is a need to standardise the assessments that are used across the country. This is not about additional assessment. It's reflecting the fact that 30 of our 32 local authorities already use a form of assessment. Uh, I think it makes sense that they all use the same form of assessment, uh, but it will replace the existing assessment so it doesn't increase uh, workload for teachers or for students. Secondly, this is not about assessment that is intended to be the be-all and the end-all in terms of measuring children's performance. It is intended to provide evidence that then informs teacher judgment, not replaces teacher judgment, but informs 
teacher judgment. Uh, I have no desire to see a return to league tables and we will, one of the issues we will engage very closely with teachers and others on is about how we use uh, this information in order to avoid crude league tables uh, being drawn from it. But I am determined and I make no apology for this that we have better information about the performance of young people in primary and lower secondary school. Ruth Davidson and I have just had an exchange about uh, higher passes in STEM subjects. The truth of the matter is uh, any one of us can go and look at higher passes and other qualifications in upper secondary and see how young people are performing and see what the attainment gap is. We cannot do that in the same way for primary school and for lower secondary school and I don't think that is acceptable. Will it any? That is yes, cheered by the Conservatives. Um, <laughs> but, Settle down, Mr Rennie. Because that's all fine, but in the old days, when the First Minister was in opposition... Order! Let us hear Mr Rennie. That is all fine, but in the old days, when the First Minister was in opposition, she complained about targets and league tables. Back then... She said, governments are attracted to things that are easy to measure and just as easy to manipulate. Back then, she agreed the aim too often was to come top of national league tables rather than serving pupils' needs. So her past self and the EIS are at one, but not now. Now it seems only the Conservatives are on board with her on national testing and league tables. Will she stand with the teachers or is she just going to stand with the Conservatives? First Minister. Sorry, if, if this wasn't so serious, I would struggle to get to my feet and answer this question for the laughter uh, that uh, is inspired by Willie Rennie's last question there. You know, in the good old days, uh, or they're not the good old days as far as Willie Rennie is concerned, i.e. the last five years, it's been Willie Rennie uh, constantly and consistently cheering uh, the Conservatives. Look, my, my, views, my views expressed all those years ago that Willie Rennie has just quoted, they haven't changed. I don't want to go back to national testing that was in place previously, the kind of high stakes national testing where pass or fail is the only measurement of a young person's performance in school. That's not what I'm proposing. Equally, I have no intention of having leaked tables of school performance produced. But I am determined that we get the information in a consistent and clear way that allows us to know what's working in our education system and what is not working, because it would be an absolute abdication of my responsibility as First Minister not to do that. So I will stand uh, with the young people of this country, the kids who we need to do more to make sure that they can achieve their full potential in school. And I make absolutely no apology for wanting to ensure that we have a world-class education system for everybody, but we make sure that in the areas that need it most, we are driving up improvement. Question four, Kermidi. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. To ask the First Minister what steps the Scottish Government is taking to promote Scotland as a competitive location for film and TV production. First Minister. Uh, we've got no current plans. To, oh, sorry, um, I'm on the wrong question. <laughs> it's question four, First Minister. Question four. Uh, obviously, the figures produced uh, <laughs> the figures produced this week uh, showing the increase in investment in shooting in films in Scotland uh, were extremely uh, encouraging. As the Government, we have recently announced additional support for the film sector in Scotland and we want to continue to do that so that we can ensure uh, that a sector that contributes so much uh, to our economy continues to be well supported. I thank the First Minister for that full answer. Welcome as the record spend on TV and film production in Scotland is, 
Does the First Minister agree with me that the BBC charter renewal process must be used to champion increased and fairer funding for productions from Scotland from the licence fee? And as the expansion of investment in Scotland's screen sector from this increase would be transformational, does she share my disappointment at the BBC's first formal response to the charter, which shows absolutely no ambition for Scotland? First Minister. Uh, yes, I strongly agree with that. Fair funding uh, for Scotland from TV licence fees collected would allow for a dramatic expansion in TV production in Scotland. Uh, the BBC's response to the Green Paper on Charter Renewal published on Monday has, I think, some merits, but I think it also falls far short of our ambitions for BBC Scotland. Uh, they've made some relatively minor proposals in news and current affairs and the online presence of the BBC in Scotland. They're to be welcomed, but I think they're overdue and they don't need a new charter to be effected. I don't think that can be the limit of the BBC's ambitions for Scotland, uh, and so we will use the charter renewal process to build support for a better, bolder BBC in Scotland that reflects our national life. Claire Baker. Um, at a Creative Industries conference this week, it was clear that the lack of a film and TV studio in Scotland is hindering the growth of the sector. Poseidon Officer, there was a film studio announced over the summer. It was in Yorkshire. Scotland Productions sits sixth position in the UK outside of London. We are behind Northern Ireland, Wales and other English regions. I appreciate there are negotiations ongoing, but can we expect an announcement any, any time soon? First Minister. Well, as Claire Baker will be aware, there is work ongoing to seek to deliver a permanent film facility for Scotland uh, that is consistent with European state aid rules, and we hope to be in a position to make an announcement as soon as possible. But you know, I really don't think we should lose sight of the significant good news uh, that was announced this week. Uh, film and TV makers invested more than £45 million in Scotland last year. That's an increase of almost £12 million on the previous year and more than £20 million higher than five years ago. Uh, obviously, as I've already indicated, uh, the Culture Secretary announced uh, earlier this year two new funds for additional financial support for Scottish TV and film, and we'll continue to make sure that we do everything possible to support what is an extremely important and valuable industry for Scotland. Question five, Rhoda Grant. To ask the First Minister what discussions the Scottish Government has had with women's groups following reports of the UK Government plans to devolve abortion law. First Minister. Uh, last year, the Smith Commission report recommended that further serious consideration should be given to the devolution of abortion. A final decision hasn't yet been taken by the UK Government, but this Government's view is that abortion should be devolved to bring it into line with almost all other health matters. Uh, this Parliament is responsible for giving scrutiny to how the NHS in Scotland operates. It should also be responsible for setting the laws that the NHS works to. Uh, however, Presiding Officer, let me be absolutely clear. The Scottish Government's position on abortion law remains unchanged. We have no plans to change the law on abortion. Indeed, the Cabinet Secretary for Health is writing to a number of women groups this week uh, to confirm this and to offer to meet with them if they would find that helpful. Rhoda Grant. Um, I listened to that response with interest. I'm glad she's aware of the concerns of women's groups such as Scottish Women's Aid, Rape Crisis Scotland, as well as the STUC, among others. They have real concerns that this can have an impact on women in Scotland. If she has no plans to change the law, and given that we believe that power should be sought for a purpose, can I ask the First Minister, what is the purpose? First Minister. I, I take the view that this Parliament should be responsible for these matters. Um, and, you know, I think that across a whole range of issues. I think, as I said, where this Parliament is responsible for uh, the NHS framework, we should also be responsible, as we are on most other matters, uh, for the laws that the NHS works within. Um, and there are many responsibilities that this Parliament has uh, on issues where I have no current plans to change the substance of the laws. That doesn't negate the issue in principle that it is this Parliament that should have responsibility. And let me be clear, uh, absolutely clear, of my own view and of the Scottish Government's position. Uh, I have uh, no intention, this Government has no intention, of legislating to change the current time limits for abortion. Question number six, Liz Smith. To ask the First Minister, in light of the proposed national system of standardised assessment in primary schools, whether the Scottish Government will reinstate the progress in international reading and literacy and trends in international mathematics and science studies for Scotland. First Minister. 
Uh, we have no current plans uh, to reintroduce these studies. In terms of assessment, though, as I have just outlined uh, to Willie Rennie, we continue to engage with local government teachers, academics and parents to inform, uh, inform our approach. By standardising assessment, we will replace the variety of different systems used by local authorities and therefore reduce the burden of assessment on teachers and children and provide a clear and consistent picture of children's progress to inform teacher judgment, not replace it. Uh, the First Minister will know that several experts in education, both at home and abroad, believe that both the TIMS and PEARLS measure the qualitative progress that pupils make in relation to the curriculum in a way that does not happen with other tests. Will the First Minister acknowledge that Scotland's absence from these two tests is in conflict with her own commitment to Willie Rennie to improve the quality rather than the quantity of data that we have to hand? First Minister. Well, I'll continue to keep all of these matters under review, but I think it's important to point out, and I'm sure Liz Smith is well aware of this, since the year 2000, I think, we've participated in what is the largest international survey, the Programme for International Student Assessment, PISA, which is run by the OECD. It focuses on maths, reading and science. And I think this is an important point. Unlike TIMS and PIRLS, the two uh, surveys that Liz Smith is referring to, all OECD countries participate in PISA. And it's therefore a more effective indicator of how the whole Scottish education system is performing relative to other countries. So I think we have uh, that information that allows us to make international comparators. And with the proposals that we're taking forward around assessment, uh, that can be supplemented with information about how we're performing domestically as well. But of course, we'll continue uh, to look at these things uh, to make sure that we are equipping ourselves with the information we need uh, to do the job of raising attainment and closing the attainment gap. Thank you. That ends First Minister's questions. We are now moving on to members' business. Members who leave the chamber should do so quickly and quietly.